Welcome back, everybody. Russell Gray, co-host of the Real Estate Guys radio show and our ongoing series on trying to make sense of silver. Everything you always wanted to know about silver, but didn't even know to ask. And of course, riding shotgun and bringing his uh, decades of expertise is uh, our good friend, Dana Samuelson. Hi, Russell. Good to see you. It's good to be seen and good to have you with us. So in this episode, Dana, we're going to be talking about silver purity. We touched a little bit about that on the last episode. We're going to talk a bunch about premiums and pricing because there are components of cost. It's not just the raw price of the silver. Uh, and there are sometimes some fluctuations. And if you know what you're doing, you, you'll know when you're maybe overpaying or not getting the best possible price versus when you really potentially getting a deal. Uh, and then we'll talk about packaging because when these things show up or when you walk out of the store with them in your possession, what's that look like? You know, what, what are you carrying out? You know, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, so let's just kick right off with, with purity. So we talked last time a little bit about uh, the different types of silver, bullion, numismatic, junk, jewelry. And even within the bullion world, we talked about uh, purity. So why don't you just kind of give us a refresher on that, Dana? Well, uh, silver today is made, it's pure. It's, uh, we, and we define that by being at least three nines fine, 0.999 pure silver. Now there are some products out there like the Canadian Maple Leaf that you like, Russ, that is four nines fine. And that's, in my opinion, that's really parsing a little bit because once you get out to that fourth decimal pace, place, you really, you know, it's, it's minuscule. The, uh, well, let me you know, tell you my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the East loves precious metals. If there's going to be a bid on precious metals in the future, as the East ascends in power, my thought is I want to own it in the form they're most likely to bid for. And they like four nines over three nines is my understanding. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that, that's my thinking. No, that's, that, that is true. That's exactly true. So that's, uh, that's pure silver. And then there's, you know, silver, it's not quite as soft as gold in pure format. It's a little bit more durable, but still relatively soft. So to harden it up a little bit, they'll often make something that's a little bit less than pure and adding a little bit other metal to that uh, pure silver will harden it up quite a bit. So old silverware is 92.5% pure. The old dimes and quarters and half dollars, 1964 and earlier, they needed to be durable in currency. So those are 90% silver by purity. They have a little bit of copper and a little bit of uh, mostly copper added to that. I thought it was zinc, not zinc. It was zinc too, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, to, to make up the difference, it hardens it up a little bit more. So you put a coin into currency, it'll last 20 or 25 years without wearing out, where a pure silver coin won't. So that's, that's what we mean by purity. How, uh, how uh, many parts are actually silver compared to what else might be in it. And yeah. pure silver is triple nine fine or better. All right, so now let's talk about something that's really a bigger problem in gold than it is at silver, at least at the prices that we're at in the summer of 2020. Uh, but, you know, somewhere down the road, silver could go to $150, $200 an ounce, let's say, and all of a sudden, maybe the game changes. But that's counterfeiting. And so, you know, if you're a novice and you're out there buying, besides the obvious thing, buy from a reputable dealer that you know, like, and trust. Um, but... Uh, are there concerns that people should have? What should they know about counterfeiting, maybe spotting counterfeits or avoiding counterfeits? Well, it's, uh, silver, because it has such a lower price point relative to gold, it doesn't incent the counterfeiter to really try and replicate it. You know, they can take a metal like tungsten, which has almost the same density as gold, and take a, a bar of tungsten and plate it with gold and replicate what might be a real gold bar. And it looks pretty good, it won't fool me, might fool you, but in silver, the incentive to do that is much less. Now, in classical vintage coins or numismatics that we talked a little bit about in our last segment, you know, scarce or rare dates, you know, sometimes they get counterfeited because if you can take an 1889 Morgan dollar, which is a common coin minted in Philadelphia, and add the Carson City mint mark to the back just by adding two letters and fool somebody, well, then you got a, a couple thousand dollar coin. So How do you protect yourself against that, Dana? Deal with reputable dealers, you know, who know what they're doing. We had a, a, a client or a prospect actually send us a picture of an 1889 
Carson City silver dollar yesterday, but it was a fake because it had raised little dimples on the surface, which are indi indicative of a coin that was made with a mold and not a coin that was struck with dyes like this. It doesn't look like a mint made product. I know uh, that, yeah. but you don't know that. Now, right. I tell this poor gentleman that his coin was not, you know, US minted product. It was probably Chinese made. So, so he probably thought he got a deal on it. He was calling you to sell it and, and, and make his quick profit and found out he was the quick profit. Right. Or he was trying to take advantage of me, which happens oh. sometimes too. People know what they're doing and they try to get whoever is the greater fool. So you don't want to be the greater fool. So. Well, that's why we're doing the series, Dana. You know, I mean, I've known you for a long time and you've been in the business a very, very long time. And so when it comes to somebody that I can talk to that I feel will tell me the truth and is qualified to have an opinion, you're the man. So I appreciate <laughs> you true. taking time to do this series with us. So let's move on and talk a little bit about pricing. This is a big one. I mean, obviously, when you're converting your dollars into silver, people think about buying. And I suppose in truth, you are. Uh, to me, it's just a conversion. You know, I'm just moving from one form of liquid wealth to another form. Now, granted, there's no friction in dollars. You know, if I have dollars in my possession and I go spend them, there's no, there's no dilution. There's no uh, commissions or premiums. You know, if, like in stock trading, stocks have literally become a currency because right. they've virtually eliminated the friction. I mean, you can trade blocks of stocks through these trading apps and whatnot for you know, maybe five bucks a trade. And when you're trading a thousand or two thousand dollars, the, the friction is negligible to almost not be there. And of course, part of that is to create a market because when you lower the friction, you know, stuff stuff trades quicker, right? That by right. definition, friction slows things down. So right. that's what that term means. And so there is a little bit of friction when you move in and out of currency. So again, I don't think that way because I don't use metals as a trading vehicle, but you do have to accept just like with home equity, if you have a bunch of equity in your property, if you want to get it out, there's some friction. You're going to have uh, loan fees and appraisal fees, and you're going to have fees. So you're going to get to the money and at the end of the day, a lot of people do it because whatever they're going to do with the money or whatever interest their savings by refinancing is worth it. But there is friction there. And so the same is true in, in silver. So there's three components of cost that I'm aware of, Dana, and I'm going to ask you to kind of elaborate on each of them. One is the spot price of the silver. Uh, and in that is the bid and ask. And then there's the mint involvement and the dealer involvement. And those two components get thrown in a blender from, from a consumer's perspective. You know, it's not like I know what the mince fee is, but let's just talk about spot right now and what that is. And then the difference between bid and ask. Okay. So the spot price is what we quote as our buying or selling price of un, unfabricated silver today. It's based on a thousand, excuse me, a 5,000 ounce COMEX contract, which is a futures contract. So if that's where we get the spot price from. And that is a discovery market because there's people, investors and speculators all the time buying and selling these contracts uh, in New York and London and in Asia. It, it tr silver trades almost continuously, 24 hours a day, five and a half days a week. And that's how we determine what we're using as our baseline to go from uh, and how we price the metal. So is there more buyers than sellers, the spot price goes up. More sellers than buyers, the spot price goes down. So that is where we get the spot price from, is from the futures contract. So that's how we start. Uh, it's a very competitive market and it's widely traded. Uh, then the mints, you know, making a silver bar, a thousand ounce bar, which is what, the, if you buy a 5,000 ounce silver contract from the COMEX exchange and you don't sell it back to the exchange, they're gonna send you 5,000 ounce bars, which are about this big. They weigh about 70 pounds each uh, and they're bulky. And there's really no way to sell 500 ounces unless you get out a hacksaw and cut that bar right in half, which I've actually done once or twice because if the bars get a little too heavy, they have a little tolerance you can't ship them with the post office or UPS because over 70 pounds is an unshippable bar. It's too heavy. So oh, that man. happens once in a while. Yeah, you no, keep, you I, keep enlightening me. I keep learning all these interesting little uh, trivia, precious metals trivia that I didn't know. Right. Okay. So uh, thousand ounce bars really aren't practical. So most manufactured silver is a hundred ounce bar, a 10 ounce bar, a five ounce bar, or a one ounce 
coin, which is actually just a round bar. Yeah. Or, so let's bring it back down to pricing because we're just, you know, we're just, this is Joe Blow in the street trying to figure out silver and we don't want to get lost in the weeds of, uh, you know, the, the jargon and all that. But basically you've got a price for the metal itself and that mm -hmm. price is created in the futures markets. And, uh, you know, just a nickel tour on the futures markets is just where uh, there are, it's, 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 it's really designed to create pricing stability for producers because producers need to know when they make the commitment to produce, they kind of know about what their cost of production is going to be. And they don't want to start that process until they know they've got a buyer down the road. And so they will sell at a price that is today's price. That's the spot price, today's price. And the idea is that they sell it in the future for a higher, or the future buyer is going to sell for a higher price. And so they're incentivized to carry, if you will. That's mm -hmm. a, it's called the carry. And right. the only time that gets reversed is that the normal thing, the term you may hear, and I don't, I'm not showing it off to like sharing it to drag people into jargon, but it was a term that I heard when I first started studying these things that confused me. But basically when the price in the future is higher than the price in the present, that's a condition called contango. And that's the normal state of the markets. Right. Uh, every once in a while, weird things happen. And you get a thing called backwardation where it is, uh, it's cheaper to buy it in the future than in the now. I think that's right. I might have that backwards, but it doesn't matter in practical sense. When you're trying to figure out the pricing, the base, the foundational price is set in these markets where you have buyers and sellers bidding in large lots, right? right. right. Okay. Now, that, that's just the raw material. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the manufacturing expense. And so these bars and these coins are manufactured not just it by governments. And so you could talk a little bit about the private manufacturing, but whether it's private or sovereign or government, uh, there's, there's a cost of manufacturing. So talk right. a little bit about kind of that manufacturing process and maybe somebody like a golden state that I know I believe produces the slugs for the U.S. Mint. And then, and then the U.S. Mint or maybe somebody like Perth or Canadian Royal Mint or whatever. Right. So the, these uh, manufactured products, the tolerance, tolerances on them are very, very strict. They have to be pure, either three nines or four nines fine, and they have to be ex exact weight. And then if they're making, say the US Mint doesn't make their own blanks for their Silver Eagles, which you alluded to. I mean, these blanks have to be exactly perfect in Meaning size. they have no, they have, there's, there's, it's just a, like a slug. There's no impression. There's no face. There's no date. There's nothing. It's just a slug of silver that goes into a, a, a minting process where they get. Right. Think, think they of get like, impressed they roll, upon. They roll out a sheet of Play-Doh or, or dough. Yeah. And then they, they get the exact thickness they want it to be. And then they get the, the cutter out and they make the rounds that then they ship to the mints that will actually put them through their presses and strike with their dyes. Gotcha. To give an imprint on it. So there's, there's a manufacturing cost to get them pure and to get them precise. So at so, the street level, when I go to buy a coin, I'm paying for the metal, but I'm also paying for all this manufacturing. Yes, yes. Okay. And it's very competitive. It's, it's, it's not an egregious price, but it's reasonable relative to the value. Otherwise, they wouldn't sell, number one. And think about it this way. It's a hundred ounce bar is about the size of a paperback novel, weighs about eight pounds. That's a hundred one ounce silver coins. So those hundred coins are a hundred times more time and effort to make the same amount of ounces. So bars typically have a lower premium. The larger the bar gets, the lower the premium per ounce because you only have to make one bar where you might have to make 10 little bars or so in this case then then if you if your goal was just to accumulate max ounces of silver uh, at the lowest possible price it sounds like accumulating bars would be the, the the best way to do that to keep that manufacturing premium down right 100 ounce bars are the most cost effective way for the public to buy and sell physical silver with the only caveat being that they need to be a recognized hallmark. And there's four or five manufacturers worldwide that make these that we trade all the time. And then you have also have to take into consideration that you're restricted to hundred ounces. You can't sell 50 ounces unless you, of course, 
you get out the hacksaw, which I mentioned before, which you don't want to do. No. So 100 ounce no. bars are the are That's the like the opposite of something that is a certifiably accurate. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, Okay, so so now so there's a premium there, and again, this is like just feeding the supply chain. It's no different than if you go buy a tomato or a can of soup at the grocery store. There's a whole lot of people in that food chain that got it from garden to table, and you're paying for all of that. That's all built in. But when you do it at scale, the actual percentage isn't much. But because the base of silver is so low relative to gold, and this is the thing I noticed, is that when I took the difference between spot and the price I was paying that premium and divided that number by the by the spot price, I could see that, you know, where in gold, I might be paying, you know, five to 7% premium with silver, I could be paying 20, 30, 40%. I mean, it just depended on what was going on. Right. We trade gold, typically gold bullion coins in a premium over the melt value. We trade silver more in dollar units, a dollar and a quarter, dollar fifty. You know, two dollars, two fifty. It just depends on premium per product. coin. Yeah, premium per ounce. Exactly. Yeah, premium right. above the so, above the the cost of the, the the metal itself. Right. So the the dollar premiums can pretty much remain constant while the price can fluctuate. So at twelve or fourteen dollars silver, you know, a two dollar premium is more percentage wise than at sixteen or eighteen dollars silver, where you still have the same two dollar premium. But, but Danny, you're the dealer. You're not getting all that money, right? No, no. The mints don't make these for free. You know, we, we generally make a couple of percentage points when we buy and sell physical silver from the mint or from the refinery where we get the bars from to the public. Okay. So when I'm, when I'm, you know, standing there at the counter in your shop and I'm looking to buy silver and I think I'm savvy and I go look up the spot price of silver and it's, you know, 1892 or whatever the number is, and you're selling me the coin for 2150 or whatever, I'm not being ripped off, but every, that's just the, the difference between the cost of the raw metal versus the supply chain to get it from ground, uh, you know, from miner all the way into the shop and into my, my hands and my safe, right? Right, the, the vast, the vast uh, majority of that premium is manufacturing and distribution with a small profit to the dealer. It's a very competitively priced market. And, you know, we're all competing with, the, there's a lot of dealers, we all compete with each other. Well, it's know? a commodity. I mean, yeah. obviously it's a commodity. A lot of people think that's all it is, is a commodity, but it, it's really not. That's why they call it precious metals and not just metals, right? Copper, right. that's more of a commodity. Zinc, that's more of a commodity. Uh, silver, as we talked about in previous episode, is he has industrial value and does often get its price spot price affected by what's going on in the commodity markets. But it is also a monetary metal, and it can get caught up in what's going on in the currency markets more like the way gold does. And we talked about that. When we talked about kind of the split personality of gold and silver. So if you haven't seen that episode, go back and watch it. Let's move on and talk a little bit about um, now. We've talked about kind of what premiums are, but let's talk about why they fluctuate because they're not always always the same. And there is a market dynamic in there, I think, sometimes based on scarcity. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, over a 20 year period, you know, for most of that time, premiums are going to be very constant. The mints costs are fixed, the, to make the blank, to strike the coins, that really doesn't change that much. But when you get into a situation where demand can overwhelm supply, uh, you can see premium surge, which is what we saw a couple different times during the 2009, 10, and 11 financial crisis. You know, the mints couldn't keep up with production for the amount of demand uh, that came from outside from the public. So people bid the premiums up to get the product. Dealers like myself had to bid the pre premiums up to get the product. So that's when premiums can rise. By the same token, when there's a lot of people who are just want to sell silver, say the economy is doing great and they want to put money into stocks, uh, there are times when we'll actually have some deals on silver eagles or silver maple leaves. Or right. You send out, you send out those every once in a while, you know, you'll have a, a big seller come in and dump a bunch of inventory on you and you've got to get back to liquid again. You're like, hey, we're having a blowout. You know, I just had 10,000 ounces of whatever come in and we'll let it go at this lower than market premium, you know, minimum X, you right. know, good as long as supplies last. Right, more supply than demand. So that's when we can make deals. And that 
we've done that, of course, and you've seen some of those emails. So yeah, and so I think the thing that people need to understand here is this is just like real estate. Great deals move quickly. And so right. if you're on somebody's mailing list and they send you something and it's a good deal, if it's truly a good deal, it comes and goes pretty quickly. If you're right. getting those good deal emails every day and hey, last chance and reminder, reminder, then it's like maybe it's not such a good deal. Um, but, but the thing is, in order for you to take advantage of a legitimately good deal, you have to have a little bit of experience to understand what it is you're looking at. Now, let's just talk about junk silver and premiums real quick, because as we're sitting here in July of 2020, uh, I've seen premiums as high as 6 to 7 $8 over spot. And I remember times when that was, you know, a buck and a half. And I'm just wondering, you know, obviously, there, nobody's manufacturing, except for, except for those counterfeiters, nobody's manufacturing more junk silver. So what is a, what is a premium telling you in terms of action? Should you, should you say, hey, this is too much a premium to pay? Is it signaling a, a shortage that could turn into a real shortage and a big price boost? I mean, do you have, and I'm not saying there's an answer, but I'm just wondering in your experience, that, does do those premiums talk to you? Do those premium fluctuations talk to you as an investor, as a dealer about what's going on? Well, it just means that when premiums rise, it just means there's a lot of demand and there's just not enough product to go around. So that's what happens. Now, uh, because 90% silver, the junk silver is not pure, we typically buy it a little bit under melt because the last buyer, the buyer of last resort would be a refinery and they're not going to pay the full silver spot price for that because they got to get that little bit of other out to make it. So they've got a purification premium or discount that they're giving you when you sell unpure silver. Exactly. Note to self, four nine silver might be a better way to go. Just saying. Right, so we're not, we're not paying a manufacturing premium to get it from a, a brand new manufacturer today because it's already made. Right. So we buy it a little under melt and we sell it for a little over melt. Yeah. Now, in a situation when there's a lot of demand, well, the bid will rise. So right now, the bids on junk 90%, we're paying a dollar and two dollars over melt to buy it, and we're selling it for three to four to five dollars uh, per ounce over over melt to sell it because there's just more demand than there is physical product to go around. And the caveat is, we can't go to the mint and say, "Hey, make us more of this." Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, you know, that's, it, it's, that's an right. it's basically a rising premium is an indication of shortage and a low premium is an indication of abundance. And there are times when a below market premium, meaning one particular dealer is offering something below everybody else, means he's got a glut of inventory he's trying to liquidate. Is that right. fair? Right. That's, nine, that's the case 95% of the time. But every once in a while, a dealer will sell silver at cost or a little under cost to uh, get people on their list, on their Ooh, list. insider tip. Yeah, and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not so good because lost leaders typically mean they want to sell you something they, they can make more money on, like higher priced numismatics or collectibles that maybe not be, may not be the best thing for you to own. Yeah, well, I go back to if you don't know what you're doing, stick with, you know, sovereign minted bullion and you're going to be in pretty good shape, especially if you're dealing with a reputable dealer. And when, you know, if you decide to really get into this and decide to delve into, you know, some of these other more esoteric uh, areas, especially numismatic, then for sure you're going to want to have somebody like Dan. And Dana, just just speaking of uh, numis, numismatics, I can't say there's another word, but I can't, I'm not even gonna, but, but you had some involvement in, in an organization. I mean, you've got some real expertise in this area, right? Oh, yes, yes. I've been in the marketplace for 40 years and I'm a member of the Professional Numismatists Guild, which is the leading- See, now you had a hard time saying it, so I don't feel so bad. <laughs> Here I am a radio uh, guy and I, I can't say the word. Right, so um, the PNG, the Professional Numismatist Guild, is the leading organization of rare coin dealers in the United States. You have to be invited to become a member. You have to abide by a code of ethics. You have to have financial wherewithal. And you have to agree to binding arbitration, which means if I get into a dispute over another party, whether it's another dealer or a client over a transaction, I agree to be... Uh, subject to binding arbitration uh, with a jury of my peers where we can both go and not have to go to court to come up with a solution. Yeah. The PNG wants the best thing for the hobby and for the public. And I'm a past president of the PNG, which is, you know, 
there's only been about 30 of them in the last 60 years. So we have a two year term. So uh, it's, it's really a, quite an honor to be a member of the PNG and to be a past president. So, well, well, that's, that's why you're my guy. Right. So good. So, um, all right, well, let me, uh, Oh, I know the one last thing I want to throw out there when, you know, when I see premiums start to rise, to me, that's an indication of shortage. And the big question in my mind is what is the cause? It sends, that's, that's a signal to me to research why is there a shortage? Of course, the easiest thing for me to do is call you uh, and look at the basic headlines and see if there's an obvious answer. If there isn't, or I get some suspicion that, hey, maybe, you know, we're like, there's a real problem out there. Uh, and there's going to be a shortage and a big spike in price. I may want to make a move. You know, that's the type of thing of just understanding where you're at. So uh, I'll just throw that out there. You don't need to comment. Let's um, close this thing up and just talk a little bit about packaging. You know, um, there's tubes, there's bars, there's bags, there's, there's boxes. I hear this term monster box people mm -hmm. banty about. What are all those? I mean, when you walk into uh, a silver dealer or you call a silver dealer or buy something online and they ship it to you, um, what are these different packaging and options and what does that look like? And are there pros and cons or anything anybody that you think needs to know? Well, it's, it's really not that important. It's kind of a ancillary top, topic. Uh, you know, 100 ounce bars typically don't come in packaging. Uh, one ounce bullion coins, they come in tubes of 20 or 25. Uh, monster boxes are simply a, a term we've come up with for uh, 500 ounce boxes, uh, 500 ounce um, uh, boxes that the mints, the Canadian mint, the US mint, uh, the Australian mint, the Austrian mint, that's how they ship this to their distributors and to their dealers. I've actually got a, a monster box right here. This is a 500 ounce box of silver eagles. It doesn't yep. have any silver in it, otherwise it'd be a hard time lifting it, but it's, it's about the size of a shoe box. It's you think thick. they would have made theirs blue and not green. I mean, it's US, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, Yes. Yeah. So, but it, they, they come banded. Yes. And they come straps on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, is it bad if you take the straps off? Does that all of a sudden like delegitimize the box or create a problem? If you leave it banded, is it more valuable? Does that make a difference? Uh, occasionally you can get a little bit more for what we would call a mint sealed box versus an unsealed box, especially for earlier dates that are a little bit scarcer. But if, if I've sold a, a mint sealed box to one of my clients and they send me that box back, I'm not going to want to open it because I know that I sourced it to start with and that, you know, it comes back with my sticker on it. And I know it's my, my material to start with. Yeah. If someone comes in off the street and wants to sell me a box, you know, I weigh it before I open it, but I still want to open it to make sure that someone's not bringing me a box of rocks that just, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> so, okay. Well, good stuff. Thing. And then, and then junk silver, uh, just bags, right? Yeah. We just counted out, by the, by the amount of coins that someone wants to buy. We trade it by the face value, not by the coin. It's just because we have a standard unit. So I call of, you up and say, Dana, I want $100 of junk quarters. Right. So you'll and get 400 quarters. If you yeah. wanted the same $100 worth of dimes, you get 1,000 dimes. Half dollars would be 200 half dollars. Yeah. This, uh, that same $1 face value is the same per unit in ounces, 0.7 or 7 0.715 ounces per dollar face value. Okay. That's it's just, it's just a little weird. So would you consider things like peace dollars or Morgan dollars? Are those, th those are, those sell above the cost of a bullion coin. Is that, that, would you consider that a numismatic coin? Yeah. Um, we, in circulating condition, they're pretty common. A lot of them survive today. We yeah. are starting to see some Chinese counterfeits in that regard. So be a little careful there. That's why having an established relationship with a long-term dealer yeah. is important for a couple different reasons. You're going to make sure you get good product, number one. Number two, you're going to get competitive pricing better than a pawn shop. You're going to get the real product. And number three, you know, when things get hot, like we've been through a phase like that, you're going to get preferential treatment if you have an established relationship. It's the same as real out. estate. I mean, I tell you it's all the time, you, you know, you do what you got to do to be the person who gets the phone call when the hot deal hits the shop. I want to be at the top of that list. I'm near the top of Dana's list, I think. And I keep working okay. to get, I keep working to be at the very tippy top of it. Uh, okay. So that's good stuff. Any closing thoughts on silver purity pricing premiums and packaging before we wind down this uh, module? No, the only thing that I would really add is that sometimes when premiums get a little hot, you, there are other products you can shop around. So there are alternatives. So if 
Like right now, Silver Eagles are bringing a little too much. We're paying a little too much for them, but we're selling them for even a bit more. So I'm doing much more volume in Canadian maple leaves or British Britannias or South African Krugerrands right now because they're just better value for the public. So that's one of the arbitrage opportunities that exist. Yeah, and again, that goes back to just when someone is eating, breathing, living, sleeping, you know, in that space all the time. Like we do the boots on the ground interviews with you once a month, like what's going on? You know, you bring that type of intel. Hey, right now, the real opportunity is over here, right? right. And again, right. these are subtle differences. At the end of the day, if you're accumulating precious metals for the long term, it might not be worth your time unless you're, you're placing huge orders. But if you do want to get the maximum out of every dollar and you're, you know, kind of enamored of the subject matter as I am, I'm a coin collector at heart, uh, then it's kind of fun to kind of understand what, what are all these pieces. That's why I thought the series would be fun to do because I've spent a lot of time in my career explaining to real estate investors precious metals and not just, you know, how to use them strategically, but to get into the weeds a little bit about like, what is this really all about? How does it work? So I think we've covered a lot of ground. We've got two more modules left to go before we call this a day. So uh, Dana, thanks so much for, for sitting in on this one. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you, Russell. Always great to be with you. Hey, thanks for watching our silver investing series videos. We hope you're getting a lot out of them. Before you go, three things. Number one, subscribe. When you subscribe, you build up our subscription base and that helps us reach more people. But even more important, it helps us attract great guests and subject matter experts to share their ideas and information with you. Number two, click that notification bell to make sure that when we do post a new video on this hot topic, you're notified right away. And number three, share. Please share this information with friends, help them get on board this bus, help them protect and preserve their wealth to take advantage of what's going on in the world today. All right. Thanks so much. And we'll see you in the next video.